I drive on the channel is what you might term a hero car. Often not my own hero cars, but even stuff like, say, the Vauxhall Astra GTE is an iconic and truly momentous vehicle for a lot of people for a number of reasons. Today, I am driving one of my hero cars. This is a Mark I Lamborghini Gallardo Superleggera. There have hardly been any Lamborghinis on this channel. And in fact, until last week, if you asked me, had I driven a Lamborghini, I would say no, not properly. I'd done a little bit on an airfield, and that was about it. And I don't really think that that counts. And then in the space of two weeks, I go and drive perhaps the two most iconic Gallardos. For me, the Gallardo is always gonna be the Lambo. It was the one that was out when I was at school, and let's face it, that's a, an important age when it comes to dream cars. The Mark I Superleggera came out pretty much the same time I got a driving license. And I looked at it and went, I need one of those. Now this was Lamborghini's crack at taking some thunder away from Ferrari and their lightweight track-inspired specials. Challenge to Dali, Scuderia, and later then Speciali and Pista. They followed a similar formula, throw quite a bit of carbon fibre at it and shave a fair bit of weight out. In Lamborghini's case, they took nearly 100 kilos out of this car, leaving it 60 kilos heavier than a normal 430. Up on power, granted about 530 brake, played then I think 490 in a regular 430, but it was still a reasonably heavy car. The Scuderia is over 100 kilos lighter again. But you know what? I don't mind. I really, really don't. This Lambo, the Gordo is a car that a lot of people will often accuse of being simply an Audi with a raging bull up front. And I can assure you, <laughs> this thing is proper old school Italian supercar. feels very different to the Balboni, and I'll get onto that in a little bit. But the thing that struck me most when I got in this car, there's no room in here, none. My, my hair, and this is not lockdown hair anymore, is touching the ceiling. There is no height adjustment on these beautiful looking and fairly firm fixed back carbon seats. And um, I'm not that tall. I'm about 5'10 with a tailwind. <laughs> Over six footers need not apply. This is not the car for you. These early Gardos have a completely different engine to the later ones. The 5.2 is the exact same unit, more or less, that you would find in an R8. However, this earlier 5 litre is pretty much a Lamborghini engine. That's both good and bad. It has a completely different setup. Okay, sure, it's still a V10, but it's got a different firing order, which explains why it sounds quite so different. I think it's an absolutely awesome thing. And though it may be down on power, and according to many reports, a little bit fragile, it is still quite special. Unlike a 430 Scuderia, these were available with a manual box. And the manual box, I'm happy to report, is absolutely excellent. Sadly, this is not a manual equipped Superleggera. Nearly everyone I've ever seen for sale has come with the E-Gear box. It's not great. Totally honest about that, it, it's okay. The same as pretty much most single clutch gearboxes of this era. If you want it to be even remotely smooth, you do have to lift off on upshifts. I did do some basic research on this car. I didn't want to spoil my own opinion by reading other reviews, and I tried to find a list of the changes that Lamborghini had made when they built this car. I know that they chucked loads and loads of carbon fibre at it. They also did only a limited number of colours for these cars. After all, they made only about 600 in total. And that, I believe, is worldwide production. Black is pretty rare, I believe. A lot of them were in a more leery colour, I have to say. If I was going to buy a car like this, I would want some sort of crazy green or orange, something like that. That, that would be me. That being said, the green accents on it do look pretty sensational, and in here it feels genuinely special, if not extremely claustrophobic. 
it is around town where all of these old single clutch gearboxes are always at their worst. Now, one thing I do have to say in the Superleggera's favour is that it's been very good to its extraordinarily kind owner, John, who is a man of great taste. He also brought the Cigarist to the channel that you may have seen. But yes, the changes. I haven't managed to find anything anywhere, I'm sure the document must exist, which definitively states what Lamborghini actually did in the creation of this car. I know it's gone on a diet, I know it's got a little bit more power out of the engine, and I assume the suspension is different, potentially things like the brakes as well, but I can't say for sure. I'm hoping somebody useful and uh, Lamborghini expert-y might be able to pop into the comments and tell me exactly what they did to create this thing, because I'd really like to know. I think they even went as far as creating a different lightweight casing for the gearbox, so dedicated were they in their quest to shave off kilos. A lot of people, I think, were hoping that this might have been a rear-wheel drive car, and you didn't get a rear-wheel drive Gallardo until the later Balboni. I don't think any first-gen Gallardo was ever sold in rear-wheel drive form. And I have to say, if I had one of these and a lot of money, I'd be very, very tempted to see what it'd be like with a manual box and rear-wheel drive. I think it would be very much old-school Lambo. That's a polite way of saying terrifying. It is surprisingly civilised. I know you all want me to give it the big one, and I will in a moment, don't you worry. But I'm getting it warm through and I'm getting a feel for the old girl. Aside from the fact it's extraordinarily harsh, it's not too loud in here. I'm kind of surprised. A lot of cars like this, some of the old Ferraris in fact, especially the Chanchard Ali, are very noisy inside. This one's still got a full carpet and everything, and it's even got a lot of stereo kit in here, including a massive Pioneer sub behind me, which is not standard. I've lusted after one of these cars for so very long and I was hoping the prices would drop more than they did because they got to about £100,000 and just stopped. This one is actually going up for sale very shortly at Simon Furlonger, very nice company, I've dealt with them a couple of times and they also maintain it and they've done an excellent job with it. The car has been actually extremely reliable, not really put a foot wrong and has not been too ruinous. An interestingly different experience to that that Damien has had with his Balboni. One of the things that has always bothered me most about the e-gear system in here, and I know it's a strange thing, is the placement of the reverse button. Down here you have a little trio of controls which you'd just assume would be where you'd find automatic reverse and so on. But that's not what you've got. You've got Sport, fine, Auto, fine, and also the Traction Off button. Reverse is over here to the right of the steering wheel for no apparent reason other than I guess they just needed to find somewhere to put it. Very odd and it just it just annoys me that. It's one of these strange little things that Italians do. They spend so much time making certain things so beautiful and wonderful to look at and to use and then occasionally they just go, that's fine over there, sod it, let's go to lunch. So, 13 years later, What's it like? In the interest of science, let's engage sport mode and let's have fun. gearbox is aggressive. Oh yeah. Whoa. <laughs> she skips and she hops. And this car is far too firm for these roads. Jeez, on the downshifts it just gives you a smack in the back. That is bizarre. Not very necessary either, but that is the Lamborghini way, isn't it? The entirely unnecessary, yet very dramatic. Traction is excellent. The steering is infinitely better than in the Balboni. Like, seriously, way nicer. Not Ferrari good. It doesn't really feed back to you. The weighting is nice and the car is sharp actually a lot of fun. The big risk, the big issue with this car is the fact that it will hop 
it will move around on the road because it's just that way inclined. Now with the four wheel drive system, that does make it perhaps a little less terrifying than it could otherwise be. Let's see what the brakes are like, shall we? Oh, really nice. Yeah, they are good. Car's got plenty of pull from low down, but of course, like any naturally aspirated engine, it, it really does its best work from higher RPM. It turns in with a real keenness. Oh, this car is so much fun. You've got to work with it. It's not easy, and you can feel it moving under you. It's a lot more engaging than I thought it might be. The wheel kind of feeds back to you eventually, like you do have to make these little micro adjustments when you're in it, and you get into a rhythm with it. What it does share with the Balboni though is this real keenness to move off of its line under hard braking. Really bizarre. It must be the way that the suspension is set up or something, because R8s do not do that, but if it catches a little bit of camber, it will go for it. Really odd that. Of course, under acceleration, totally different experience to the Balboni. It can get all of that power down. A view out of this thing is mad as well. Everywhere you look, there's crazy lines and angles. You've got that wing cutting the rear view in half. You've got this crazy dash that makes the car feel a lot bigger than it really is. This solid carbon fiber wing mirror, which looks awesome. And I've got to say, I'm actually getting on with these seats. I was, in all honesty, fully braced for this to be a real don't meet your heroes moment. I, I honestly was. But actually, this is quite engaging. It's not the easiest car to drive. It's not the most communicative. It's not the fastest, it, it really isn't. But my life, it's, it's quite a lot of fun. You gotta be in the mood for it, you really do. But actually, I also expected it to be something of an assault on the senses, and, and it isn't. Judged really nicely in here. It makes the right amount of noise, the right kind of noise. It's a proper Lambo. Not even sure what that means, to be fair. Maybe it means the Diablo will be a disappointment when I finally get a go at one of those. In fact, if you have a Lamborghini of any description, and it's not a Gardo Balboni or a Superleggera, and you'd like to see it on the channel, please do drop me a line. The details of how to do that will be in the description of this and every other video. The steering wheel itself is actually also really pleasant to hold, and somewhat familiar, actually, because it's the same item that you'd find in an Audi RS4, like my buddy Darren's. It definitely seems to me that it's under braking, especially with that really abrupt downshift where everything could really go a bit Pete Tong in the Superleggera. But if you've got your wits about you, and the conditions are reasonable as they are today, this is certainly a car you can dance with. It's got a real alertness to it, and a keenness to turn, and a willingness to please, I have to say. This is no boring German, I assure you. like any proper Lamborghini, in many regards, it is thoroughly terrible. Servicing can be expensive even when nothing's going wrong, especially if you want to take it to a main dealer. This car's major service should have cost around £5,000, but Furlonger apparently achieved it for far less and did a good quality job. Fuel, not good, and storage space at the front is laughable. There is no room whatsoever. I can fit two backpacks in there at a stretch, that's your lot. This is really not a good car for long distance touring. Having not driven the standard car in any real meaningful way, I'm afraid I can't tell you quite how transformative the changes are with the Superleggera. All I can tell you is what it's like in isolation, and it is very enjoyable. At around £100,000 to pick one of these up too, I think they actually offer excellent value for money in comparison to Ferrari's equivalent. And so, there we have it. I have met my dream Lamborghini, and I'm pleased to say he was a bunch of great lads. That is the end of my review, but for those who enjoy this car as much as I do, I'm going to leave this video running and you can enjoy some nice V10 noises. But from me, 
It's a thank you. See you for the next one. Bye-bye.